If you've ever been to an In Nature event, you'll see a lot of things at the track that you might see at any other track. A vibrant paddock, a midway for fans to walk around and enjoy, various cars with makes, models, and classes that make up a diverse series, and the hustle and bustle of teams running around the track and paddock to repair their cars. But more often than not, once you're in the stands and look at the track, there might be one thing that grabs your attention. The logo on the track worker's shirts and the side of the trucks that reads Safety Zavari. Of course, every form of motorsports has its own version of a safety crew, with the AMR safety team being the mainstay last year as the most serious such as NASCAR, IndyCar, and IMSA, and of course, the various independent safety teams that work on little short tracks and drag ships across the country. But obviously, there isn't one in the world I would argue that has a name such as the Safety Safari that raises some interesting questions. Who are they? Who started it? And how is it still around today? Well, that is exactly what we'll discuss today as we look into the history of one of racing's earliest touring safety teams. The History of the Safety Safari The history of the Safety Safari dates back to 1954 on the time of the beginning of drag racing. Originally named the Drag Safari, the safety team consisted of a four-man traveling crew handpicked by NHRA founder Wally Parks. These four crew members were Bud Coons, Chick Cannon, Eric Rickman, and Bud Evans. That crew team were sent out to travel around the country in a 54 Dodge two-door station wagon that Bud Coons sold to Studebaker for. Carrying a camper style trailer that stored all the items they needed to host drag racing across the country, including a PA system, timing and scoring, field telephones, a one cylinder generator, and miles of metal wire to bring the electronics to life. With this equipment, they would drive around the country connecting with car clubs and drivers to set up the track, as well as promote the race to help provide and execute safe and successful drag racing events. They would usually arrive at the town hosting the event around the Wednesday or Thursday before the race and stop at the local mobile station nearby as they were the only sponsor, giving them free fuel for the long drives. Once word spread around town they arrived, hot rodders from all over would swarm the station that they were staying at. Bud Coons met with law enforcement and civil officials and he acted as the crew's public relations leader. He sometimes went out to do interviews with local radio and television stations to promote the upcoming event in the area. Well, the idea was to go out and introduce organized drag racing as a means of overcoming street racing problems because in areas outside of California, the hot rod enthusiasts, which is what they were, didn't have facilities and places where they could run and, and uh, compete with their cars. In 1979, at the 25th anniversary of uh, the National Drags, I was back in Indianapolis, and Don Garlitz came up to me and thanked me. I said, what for? He said, because in 1955, when you were down in Jacksonville, Florida, you uh, explained to me how to build a roll bar because you wouldn't pass my, my roadster for the inspection. So I explained how to build a roll bar. He went home to Ocala, built a roll bar, came down, back, passed inspection, and ran the race and won the to beat. They would tour like this for years, with the last coast-to-coast -to -coast tour being in 1956 as drag racing had taken a hold in the country psyche and led for most of its of street racing to the drag strip around the country at the time. At that same time, however, Mobile had cut their support with the drag so far due to corporate heads being worried about the company's affiliation with such a potentially dangerous sport. Despite, however, a statistic report published by the Nature before the start of the 56 tour stating that of the 434 events staged by the Nature in 1955, with more than 35,000 cars and 2,700 motorcycles competing with more than half a million spectators watching, there were less than six claims of property damage and fewer than that many for participant injuries, none of which being major. I think the surprise is today, when you look back to those primitive days when we started and look to see how far it's come. Well, now, we, got to, we got to 150 miles an hour in 55, actually, 55, uh, the engineers said impossible to go any faster. Because they'd work on their slide rules, there's no friction, all this. No, Nobody can ever go faster than 150 miles an hour. And when it got to 160, they said, well, maybe it's 175. Got to 200, you know, and they finally gave up. With the other boom of drag racing taking hold, the need for an upgrade within the NHRA's first response to allow more skilled first responders arose. In the 1970s, the NHRA went from working with local first responders for events to resurrecting the safety safari that you see today. Now a full-time crew of at least 15 full-time and about 80 part-time, these crews travel the country with the NHRA to help workers first responders to the scene of an accident. The team is made up of volunteer firefighters, paramedics, and emergency medical technicians with various certifications and training. The Safety Safari also trains track workers at each event on how to respond to situations throughout the season. The Safety Safari also works the event as a track crew that helps prep the track before and during events, as well as clearing the track of wreckage and debris to help keep the event moving. Today, the fleet consists of super trucks, jet dryers, vehicles to help spray the track, a tire dragon, which is a tractor with rotating tires on the back to help build rubber onto the track, ATVs that are used to help guide shutdown vehicles off the track, as well as Chevrolet Dooley's equipped with fire suppression systems to help with any fires that occur from a vehicle's wreck. The track will also have two ambulances with a backup, as well as a helicopter on standby in a medical center staffed with a doctor, nurse, and paramedics. 
We carry the Amcus Rescue System, which is the full set of spreaders and O cutters to extricate the driver at any given time he has an issue. Uh, on top of this, we carry the fire aid tank, which is an 80 gallon water tank. And it's uh, uh, charged with nitrogen with an 80 foot hose reel. Uh, that's something we can get out there and reach a good distance at any given time that we need to be there. We also carry a fresh air system for our uh, funny car guys that uh, we will use on our guys. We've got to get them out of the car so they don't have any smoke inhalation or any issues such as that. But other than that, that's uh, pretty much what we keep and uh, it works. In January 2022, the NHRA announced that racing safety equipment icon Simpson would become the presenting sponsor of the Safety Safari, providing the crew with safety gear to help keep them safe as they look to protect the competitors as well as keep the event moving. With that long history and background, they have been known as one of the most efficient safety crews in all motorsports and have been a gold standard in motorsports safety since their early roots in the 1950s. We had had so many fires in one year that we named the car the Safety Safari Test Vehicle. You don't know a race driver who doesn't appreciate them. They're the reason we feel so safe and have confidence in racing for NHRA. They're not part-timers. They don't have other jobs during the week. This is what they do. And they've been together for many years, and they know what to do. They've been through a lot together. It's a great confidence thing for us. We love them. Don Gay at Denver here a couple years ago where he was knocked out at and we was rolling towards him, not knowing that he was knocked out. Here come the car back at us. So that was a little awakening. We pulled it down at the end of the course and Don, Don Gay Jr.'s car was in a gulf in the fire. And I jumped out of my car and went over to help. But if it wasn't for the safety safari, actually getting in there and doing 90% of the work, uh, I don't think Don Gay would have came around. I think we'd have lost him. I don't believe a man will run into a fire to make a paycheck. And these guys are paid good out here, but bottom line, they do it to, you know, you ought to see them. I mean, I watched them uh, with a young kid at, at Denver that had a fire when Don Perdome ran over and lifted the body, and those guys were jumping right in the heat of the fire and the smoke. I mean, like, why do you want to do that? I'm inside trying to get out. They're trying to get in, and it's unbelievable. And uh, they saved uh, that young kid from Houston's life uh, at Denver. I saw professional people at work, people that didn't panic, that got in there and got the job done. You know, a lot of people can get in there and work, but not a lot of them get in there and work and know what they're doing. The safety safari, in my opinion, uh, kept things under control, got Don out of the car just as soon as they could, and they just did a great job. Okay, get on the ground. There's... If I'm in trouble, I know that they're the best in the business and they're going to be there. And I'm not just saying that. I can say it from factual experiences in two occasions where we've had tremendous crashes, and the first thing that was there was one of those guys right there with me. And uh, believe me, it's a great feeling from a driver's point of view to, to have those guys out there knowing that they do it every week. This is not a hobby with them. This is their business. Thank you guys so much for watching. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share the video. And if this video is too short for you, then I highly recommend you go check out some of my other videos as well that I have done because I have surely a catalog of other historic videos you can watch in the meantime while I work on the next one. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at MightyMac03. And be sure to comment down below on what videos you guys maybe would like to see next. And until then, this has been Mighty Mac, and I'll see you next time.